every 100 meters, the taste of biryani will change. Um, and it, bit, it, it made me understand and made me realize a little bit as to we have a very diverse space that we're working with. Within our workforces also, it's very diverse just by nature. That's the DNA of where we are today. But how do we actually leverage the diversity to gain a competitive advantage and really get the value that we want to get? So today, I'd like to invite Captain Raghu Raman. He's the president of Risk, Security, and New Venture at Reliance Industries Limited. He's also the, fo fo the former founding CEO of National Intelligence Grid. Besides that, Captain Raman has also worked in the armed forces, in the corporate sector, as well as the government. So his stories and his narratives today will come from that perspective. Captain Raman, over to you. Uh, as uh, Pooja pointed out, I've had a fairly unique uh, set of careers. I've uh, spent about 10 years in the armed forces, another 10 years in the corporates, and five years as a bureaucrat. And very often I'm asked, uh, what's the difference uh, between these three careers? And my gut answer is, in the army, at least you knew which side the enemy was. <laughs> in the other two careers, it's kind of difficult to, you know, uh, sort of make out. My introduction to diversity actually came in a very different way, because uh, I joined the army when I was very young, at about uh, 20, and at that point of time, I, I came from a very orthodox uh, South Indian family. And uh, those of you sitting over here, know that uh, we have this whole concept of not uh, drinking from someone else's glass, not even from your own glass. You try to, you know, not touch your... And you have this whole uh, concept of uh, juta, and some of our expat friends may not know it, but uh, you can't uh, take someone else's glass. So imagine uh, my mild shock that when you join the army, you get one enamel mug. That mug is your coffee mug, that mug is your shaving mug, that mug is your bathing mug, and that mug is your every other mug. Now, the problem becomes slightly more because being regulation issue, despite you scratching your name on it, invariably it gets mixed up. And soon you could be having your morning coffee in someone else's every other mug. <laughs> now, that might si seem a little awkward uh, now, but uh, we realized very soon that actually that was inoculation for us because very soon someone else's blood may be coursing through our veins. Because when you are wounded in combat, you really don't give a damn whose blood you are taking, what is caste, religion, gotra, none of that really matters. And that way, the Indian Armed Forces is an amazing place. For example, um, if you see the state of Punjab, one state of Punjab that has five regiments coming out of it. You have the Sikh regiment, the Sikh light infantry, the Punjab regiment, and a couple of regiments which went across uh, during the time of partition. That's about one lakh uh, troops coming from one single state. But the four South Indian states of India have just one regiment, the Madras regiment. You don't have a Kerala regiment, you don't have a Karnataka regiment. But if you look at the electrical mechanical engineers, the sappers, the signals, the communication specialists, uh, the medical corps, they all predominantly come from these four states. So the army, even at that point of time, was structuring the diversity and strengths and DNAs and cultures of different uh, Different, different states, different kind of people of this country. Now let me park this narrative and connect it back to you in a very, very uh, much closer to home uh, way. So uh, how many of you have seen the Golden Temple? So if you see the Golden Temple, it's, it's got high walls around it. It's got a sarovar inside it, a water body inside it. It's got a langar uh, 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 food place where they distribute food and it's got a granary inside it and its dome is covered with gold, and that's the architecture of most uh, Gurdwaras anywhere. But if you look at a South Indian temple, uh, especially the older ones, you'll find that it has no wall around it. Even if there's a wall, it's a very small wall, mainly to prevent the cattle from coming in. The pond is outside the temple, you bring food into the temple, and the carvings of the temples are so exquisite that you actually have some temples where you have different notes in different pillars, and you'd wonder, how is it that being the same religion, the root of the religion is same, but the manifestations of their place of worship is so dramatically opposite. And that wonder would go away when you would realize that a Gurdwara is actually a fortress. It's not just a place of worship. It is in the path of invasions which used to happen constantly from the east, and that is why it had to be built like a fortress. It needed to have a water body inside it. It needed to have a granary inside it, and it needed to be able to withstand a siege 
and the wealth of the community was melted and kept on top of the domes so that the aggressors couldn't get at it easily. Whereas all the people who came into South India came as traders. A complete stability, long periods of stability, and that is why a great-grandfather could begin the carving and the great-grandson would finish it. Now you park the second narrative and take any industry, let's take the IT industry for example, and you would notice that most of the uh, engineering, instrumentation, Texas instrument, these kind of technologies and companies are situated out of Bangalore. If you look at graphics, Pentamedia, Pixar Pictures, the, the animation, they come out of Chennai. If you see the trading software, uh, the barn, SAPs, uh, PeopleSoft, the construction may happen in Bangalore, but most of its deployment happens in Bombay, the trading belt. And quick and dirty work, prototyping, still comes out of Delhi. So in many ways, the industries have followed years of genetic coding, and we have not realized it, neither have we leveraged it. When I moved into my civilian career, I was fortunate to have uh, started it uh, by setting up a, a, a school called the United World Colleges. Actually, Pooja is from that school, uh, from the very school, it was a coincidence. And this was an amazing uh, institution. It's the 10th one in India. Uh, it was founded in 1962 by a gentleman called Kurt Hahn, an educationist, who realized that the countries that were fighting with each other during uh, the World War II were working brilliantly together in NATO. And he leveraged that part and created this uh, whole institution whose um, amazing uh, differentiator is the fact that they take about 200 kids uh, in class 11 and 12. College is a misnomer, it's a school. Uh, and these uh, 200 kids represent uh, almost 80, 85 different countries. They, they come from countries that you wouldn't even have heard of. You have to actually have been shown on the map where is Eritrea and many of these countries. We wouldn't. Not only that, they also come from very different demographies and social uh, standards. And uh, as a ritual, every year, and I'm glad uh, Pooja confirmed to me that they uh, continue the tradition, they take two children from orphanages. And I remember this uh, instance, like uh, in any school, uh, in, in the food canteen, the children are always complaining about food, uh, whether it's school or college. And during one of those uh, interactions when the students were complaining about the food, suddenly this boy uh, from uh, the orphanage, he got up and he slammed his plate down. And he looked around the canteen and he said that I come from an orphanage where the only time we were given a dessert was once in a year during Diwali. So for 15 years, the only time I have got a, a laddu or a gulab jamun or whatever is 15 times in my entire lifetime and you think this food is bad. I promise you that when the kids sat down somber, the food started tasting much better after that. And I think that is the power of diversity. The power of diversity is to show people what they have rather than focusing on what they don't have. And that unleashes a very different kind of energy into the entire ecosystem. Now, this is not something that needs to be done in, a, in, in the Indian army with a lot of heritage behind it. Uh, it's not something that you need to build uh, institutions like the UWC. I'll give you an example which happened a few years ago in uh, uh, Bellinker College in uh, Bombay where I was involved with a project. And it was a completely bold project, a very bold dean and a faculty who decided to do it. They decided to take uh, two kids who were office boys, uh, regular office boys, the guys who bring us tea and move our files and clean our desks. And one of the office boys was a 12th class uh, pass uh, uh, student. And the other one had done his graduation from night school. And we picked these two kids and we gave them 14 mentors. And these 14 mentors were students of the first year. And we put these two kids with the 14 mentors and they were told that your project is to make these two kids pass the MBA with you. There will be no punches pulled back. There will be no subsidy, no, no grace marks given. You will have to teach them Michael Potter's five forces using Vada Pau language. You will have to teach them MS Word, Excel, everything that is taken for granted by any student who reaches a B school. And then something amazing started to happen. So somewhere during this whole course, uh, uh, the, the 14 mentors started getting a little frustrated. And they got frustrated because they thought that these two mentees were not uh, picking up fast enough or they were not... Uh, uh, working hard enough and I had an occasion to sort of meet with them 
And I spoke to them and I said, you know, somewhere I'm getting a feeling that you guys have started thinking that you are the ones bringing stuff to the party. Let me clear your fundamentals. So I belong to a school uh, called DTA in Delhi. And this school was a government aided school. So by uh, requirement, we had to take uh, some children who came from a very economically uh, poor Uh, no worry, you can't translate that <laughs> like this. So, um, thank you. <clears throat> so, where was I? Uh, I lost. Yeah. So this 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 school, my best friend, he came from a very very poor family, and he was so poor that uh, during winters in Delhi, and Delhi winters are pretty cold, he, he could not afford a sweater, he would not have lunch, and he'd pretend that he was in Hungary. He was that poor. And uh, like uh, good uh, students, we used to bunk uh, school very often uh, to go and watch movies. And I remember once we had bunked uh, a class to go and watch a movie, and when we reached the theater, uh, we realized the movie was houseful. Those days, movies used to go houseful. Theaters used to go houseful. And I was disappointed, and I was turning back from there, and my friend caught my hand, and he said, wait a minute. Now, what happened was that as the movie began, so those days, what used to happen in Delhi is the movie is houseful because many of the tickets have been bought, and they're being sold in black. They've been sold outside in black. So five rupee tickets being sold for 20, 30 rupees. But when the movie begins, then the tickets start reducing in pricing. And when the movie begins, actually, the tickets are virtually given away for free. Now, my friend taught me some very important, he taught me the concept of perishable commodities. He taught me that when it says uh, houseful, there is always a seat available. He taught me that when it says no vacancy, there is a vacancy. When there is no budget, there is a budget. And we take about three to five years to teach it to MBA graduates when they join the corporates. <laughs> and again, it doesn't have to be an institution. Sometimes it can be programmed. Uh, so some years ago, we started a, 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 a project which we call Jamgat, for lack of a better word. And in that, what we do is we basically bring people from all different walks of life. Uh, they can be people who are creative people, who are directors, storytellers, uh, madaris, magicians, any sort of people, and just mix them up together and take any one idea and see how we can throw it up and take a look at it from all different directions and come out with some different utilizations for that. And I can give you many examples, but uh, one of my favorite ones, because I, I am from the field of, of security in some sense, was this. So many of you might, might have seen that uh, during the previous elections, uh, uh, Mr. Modi had used this 3D projection to, uh, to broadcast his presence in several places at the same time without being virtually there. Now, the cost of that uh, 3D projection has come down to really, it's really cheap now. And we were talking about how we can use this technology. And the obvious answers were for training and education and for doing these kind of uh, you know, sort of speeches without being here. Uh, but interestingly, out of that entire crowd, uh, one of the suggestions which came was that why can't we use this for security? So if you see these big buildings, especially IT buildings, and if you see that at night, you will notice that it looks a, a little uh, scary yeah, because it's dark. And they're... now what if instead of just, uh, instead of having, say, 20 guards to patrol it, you just had two physical guards, and the remaining were these virtual projections which would be moving around. And, yeah, and they would move around whenever it's triggered by emotion. So if somebody is moving in this corridor, that's the time these projections would start moving. And then someone else brings out an idea that why can't you miniaturize it and have it at the size of a, a charger or one of these instruments that we use for you know, your mosquito repellent, and put that in a home which is occupied by aged parents who are living alone, and they just plug it on, and this uh, 3D animation moves in the house, uh, giving it an impression that there is someone in the home other than these two people. And the amazing thing was, both these ideas did not come from the security people. They came from people who had a problem of fear. And that's when the penny sunk. Because in, in, in our organization, we have, uh, we have by the way, 16,000 ex-servicemen whom we employ in, in Reliance. And one day, we were standing in front of the Reliance Corporate Park. Uh, I was standing with many of my officers, and we were looking at it. And I asked them this question that, what do you see? And they saw concrete and glass and buildings in, at, at night. And I asked them, do you feel afraid? And they looked at each other, and they said, no, we don't feel afraid. I said, of course you won't. You jump out of planes. Why would you feel afraid? 
but half the demography that we are supposed to be protecting feel terrified when they see this. And that is why the solutions to some of these problems will not come from the people who are responsible for it. They will come from people who are benefiting from it. And if we don't mix these two together, this technology will lie right in front of us. It will be there, and, and we will not be able to see the answers that can come out of it. Let me give you another example of how technology and, and user interface and diversity can actually become a real force multiplier. And this is a, a, a really nice story. So there's a friend of mine who, who was an IS officer, and he was a, a district magistrate in one of the uh, districts of Kerala and in the Ambalapura belt, which is largely a coastal belt, and most of his demography is fishermen. So this is about seven, eight years ago, and our man had a little bit of surplus funds left, and he was uh, uh, one of those uh, civil servants who likes to do uh, some stuff with it. So he bought uh, GPSs, and he gave them to the fishermen. Now these fishermen are trying to figure out what this GPS is, what can it do, and all of that, but eventually they figure it out. Now my friend forgot that these uh, fishermen folk were the progeny of uh, you know, thousands of years of uh, uh, seagoing folks, and they didn't need a GPS to come back. I mean, so it was a complete waste of money. But maybe not, because what the fishermen started doing was that they would go to the fish market, and they would collect the garbage, they would collect the rotting stuff, and it's a fish market, right? So they put all of that into gunny sacks, and they would take it out into the high seas, and they would dump it there, and they would mark that spot with the GPS and come back the next day, and the place would be teeming with fish. So our, our friend gave them a GPS to come back home, and they used it to go into the sea, thus multiplying the amount of catch they got, lowering the number of times they had to go, and actually predicting the fish market. So if there was too much fish in the market, they wouldn't go out because they had an assured catch. And that's what happens when you give technology to somebody who you don't think can use it. And, and there are many such examples in our own uh, history and culture. If we just went back, uh, many of you might have seen, in, uh, especially in Bombay, and I see increasingly in, in uh, Karnataka also, you see um, uh, a kind of a, a lemon and a mirchi with a coal hung in front of cars. And many times you might have wondered what uh, it's there for. And typically, if you ask people, uh, and this is possibly a, a contraption that your driver will buy with his own money without even asking you. And they usually buy it every Saturday. And, and if you ask why he is doing it, the typical answer would be to ward off the evil eye. Now, all you need to do is to drive just 50 kilometers away from Bombay into any village, and you will realize why they do it. Because if you notice, it's lemons and it's green chili, and there's a piece of coal under it. And it's not in a string, it's in a piece of wire. Now, the reason why it's in a piece of wire is they take this contraption, they put it over flames, and when the coal starts smoldering, the juice of the lemon and the green chili, when it drops on that coal, it sends out a very astringent smoke. It's so astringent that your nose and eyes will start watering, if not bleeding. Now, this is kept in the middle of two bullocks driving away the fleas and the flies away from those two animals and thus keeping the engine of the bullock cart safe. It is our ignorance <laughs> that we think that it is superstition. Similarly, when I was uh, setting up this uh, United World Colleges, there was an instance when I had gone to London, and this was about, again, uh, about eight, nine years ago when uh, uh, the, the latest trend in security was biometrics, uh, and which is now quite uh, uh, fashionable. It's there in laptops, it's there in companies, and all of that, and people are doing away with these uh, access cards and, and making it uh, biometric. So as I was driving back to this school, uh, I used to stop at the villages, and there used to be these village uh, panchayats, sarpanches, and they used to you know, talk with me, chat up with me, uh, and they asked me, Ki, Saab, kahan se aare? I told him I'm coming from London. Achha, kis le? Why did you go there? He said, I'd gone there for a conference. What was the conference about? I said, it was about biometrics. What is biometrics? He said, you know, you can actually identify people with their iris and with their prints of their uh, fingers. And these old men are kind of looking at each other and saying, uh, for this, you had to go to London? I mean, we have been using this uh, thumbprint for the last thousands of years. <laughs> and then the penny sunk that the fact that we've been using a thumbprint to validate our documents is not so much about comparing the thumbprint, it is that firm knowledge 
that one print can never be equal as another one. And that's the reason why they have always used that as a currency of trust. So many times when we start thinking of ourselves as educated, aware, exposed to the world, we sometimes forget that uh, a lot of the knowledge is only hidden from us because we are not opening our eyes and looking at what we consider to be uh, diversity and, and we think of it as a checklist uh, and, and we you know, sort of uh, uh, go with that. And I just want to end with a couple of points and take you back to that story of these two kids who uh, became graduates from Wellinker College. When they passed out, uh, in the 16, uh, so 14 of the mentors and two of these mentees, they were actually 9th and 11th. So they beat uh, their own mentors when they passed out. But most importantly, they did something else. They were earning 5,000 rupees a month as you know, office help. And the first job that they got was with ICICI Bank where their annual salary was 6 lakhs. So from 60,000, they jumped to 6 lakhs, 10x. And they became customers for ICICI Bank. They became customers for Mahindra. They became customers for HDFC. And it was done at zero cost because there was no cost that was incurred. The 5,000 rupees that these people would have earned was paid 10 times over in one year. And more importantly, they taught rest of the people what street savviness is, how business is done, who is the real title, who holds power, because a lot of the people who pass out from B schools will be chasing some fancy title, vice president, photocopier or something and thinking he makes the decisions. <laughs> Whereas the real decisions are being made by somebody else. But more important, what they did was another leap that India needs very much. You go to the US, you go to Europe, and the girl who is serving you in a McDonald's counter could be doing a PhD from the university there. Many of the people who are serving you across the counter will never be able to leap from that side to this side for the rest of their life. They will keep moving up. They will go from a barista to maybe a five star, but they will never ever make that leap. And with this one project, they actually crossed this chasm of 10x, which we need to do in this country. If we don't do that, we are looking at a security problem like nothing else. I mean, our biggest security problem is the millions of young aspirational workforce coming into the job market where there are no jobs. My last point is about LGBT because I think that is still the elephant in the room and uh, people you know, uh, think about it, they evade it. and they... So let me tell you something about it in a, in a very different way. When an organization starts opening about the most uncomfortable issues, so let's say an organization starts talking openly about LGBT, what it does is, it enables, and the lady here who asked the question that do you ask them voluntarily or do you, you know, take it from them uh, when they are joining, it enables every other persecuted minority, whether it is a woman who is uh, persecuted by her husband who is getting beaten, whether it's a, it's a person who has got uh, dyslexia, whether it's a person who is afraid, it gives them the courage to come out in the open and imagine. Many organizations, there are people who have got fears and traumas and when they wake up in the morning every day to work, they have 100 ounces of energy. And they waste 70 ounces of that energy just covering up, covering up their fears, living a half life, living only 20 to 30 percent of their full potential. Now when you take an issue which is controversial and put it out there in the open and say this is what we want to talk about and this is the distance we are willing to go, it actually unleashes that 70% energy into 1,000, which is the number of employees, and it puts wind under the wings of, of, of that organization. So whenever we think about, uh, uh, about uh, that we are doing a favor to these two office boys by giving them an opportunity, we are not. We are actually creating a marketplace. We are creating a new generation of consumers. And finally, the world of the future is going to have uh, three or four characteristics which we don't start adapting to. Firstly, the marketplace is going to be global. How can you be a global company if you're parochial in your structuring? How will you design a product for women if you don't have women in your design team? How will you address that uh, huge market of, of uh, LGBT or, or disabled people if you don't understand how they think and what they go through? So no company which has global aspirations can do a staffing which is parochial. 
Second point, the customers are not now going to buy just products, they're going to buy companies. And you're already seeing that. Customers punish companies that uh, uh, do environmental degradation. They punish companies which do uh, indulge in child labor. And they are going to punish companies who do not embrace diversity. So that's going to happen pretty soon. Thirdly, the talent market will punish you. We've seen organizations which openly embrace uh, LGBT or any other kind of uh, uh, issue that people try to skirt around. They are first preference in case of talent war. Even if the person who is coming in is straight or is fully uh, abled, they still prefer to work in an organization which is a benign organization, which is a healthy organization, which has wind under its wings. That kind of an organization. And lastly, we are facing a world which is going extremely innovative, nimble, and agile. And homogeneous organizations, by definition, cannot be agile. If thinking is alike, then you will have an Uber who will come in with no background of transportation and remove an entire industry. You will have Airbnb, which will come in with no background of hospitality and become the largest hotelier in a matter of 36 months. Now, if you need agility in your organization, you need the ability to move quickly on a dime, by definition, you need to have a spark of dissent internally. Because if there's no dissent, if it is homogeneous thinking, you're a super tanker which will see an iceberg in front of you, which will keep debating whether we turn right, turn right, turn left, and continue running course. And by the time you take the decision, your nose may miss the iceberg, but your tail is going to go and hit it. And when the tail goes and hits it, water will start flooding in through one hold, and the ship will start tilting to the left. Now, that is visible to everybody, including the shareholders and the market. So you'll quickly put water on the right hold to make the ship evil key again, and that will cause a drag. The speed will slow down, and that is also noticeable to the market. So you'll start pumping in more fuel to retain the same speed, and that is the definition of every large homogeneous organization, more fuel burnt per kilometer of progress. So diversity, to my mind, is not a checklist. It is not an option. It is an existential issue. And I think we are standing on the verge of a paradigm. And people who can understand this, who can see this, they have an element of diversity in them. And people who can't see this, they are dinosaurs. They are going to become extinct. So the choice is not about whether we need to do it. The choice is do we need to live or do we need to perish? That, to my mind, is the essence of diversity. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Captain Raman, may I ask you to please stand here before you go yet? Um, I think listening to him, I'm still percolating a lot of these thoughts in my head. But one thing that I have taken away from this conversation is that we have yet to tap into the true value of diversity and inclusion, and the opportunities are galore. So if we think that we're close to the finish line, ladies and gentlemen, we're way far ahead, and we have a lot more to go to. So thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. On behalf of NASCOM, we'd like to give you a small token of our appreciation.